to bring in Jonathan Sheridan. He's joining us from Fig Security. So let's talk about this global rates environment. Good afternoon to you, by the way. Good afternoon, Nadine. Uh, I guess we could start by talking about the Bank of England. Um, surprised many in the marketplace by not cutting rates. Obviously, it's a judgment call at the end, but the BOE clearly sees the risks to the downside to the economy in the wake of this uh, British exit from the European Union. So was it just a matter of them waiting to see more economic data before that August meeting that kept them on the sidelines? Look, I, I think that, um, as you say, it was a surprise. Um, and I do agree with you that they, they see downside to the economy. But the positive thing about the announcement was that, in the Bank of England's opinion, that markets are functioning normally. So there was no liquidity crunch. You know, the currency performed as expected when, you know, it's sold off about 10 percent and then it's come back a little bit since then. So, um, you know, the financial stability is, is one of the key things that uh, central banks look at. And when markets are functioning efficiently, then um, you know, outside of the, the broader economic effects that they like, then they're obviously, uh, in this case in particular, not keen to change policy settings when markets are functioning as they expect. Mm -hmm. And then you have what's happening in the U.S. It seems as if the U.S. Federal Reserve can always find a reason to hold. <laughs> um, perhaps some would say there will always be something out in the marketplace to keep you on the sidelines, you know, to say, don't do it, don't do it just yet. But when you look at what's happening in the U.S. in terms of economic data, and now if we can go by Alcoa and J.P. Morgan company profits, it certainly seems as if the reasons for waiting um, are decreasing in the U.S. Is that how you see that equation? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the earnings season is, is interesting. Uh, the actual consensus expectations have been managed down very successfully by the companies, and then, you know, they're all attempting to beat that. Um, JP Morgan, for example, did beat expectations by recording only a 1.8% fall in earnings. You know, so um, it's the seventh consecutive earnings season where average earnings have fallen, uh, and yet we're seeing stock prices at record highs. So there's this interesting divergence in markets at the moment where bond markets are making record lows in yields and stock markets are making record highs. Uh, one of them's got to be wrong. And, um, you know, given earnings are falling, um, we're not seeing inflation pressures, you know, in the, even in the really strong payrolls number we had last week, there was no real wage growth and, and that translates into no real inflation. I think that the bond markets are going to be uh, proved correct in this instance. Yeah, interesting. Um, so all of this hunt for yield, I mentioned the German, uh, the Japan situation when it comes to yields, is um, pushing a lot of people into perhaps more riskier corporate debt. Now, we continue to see strong flow into Newcastle Coal, I believe, for example. Um, could you give us the details on that one? Tell us how much it's paying and um, structurally, I guess, where the risks are. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, particularly with the currency at, at elevated levels against the US dollar, this is uh, a good bond for, uh, for our clients. It seems they are continuing, as you say, to chase yield. It's the Newcastle Coal Terminal. So, you know, coal's been uh, back in favour in the last month or so. We had a, a Morgan Stanley report saying that, uh, at least in the near term, the future of coal looks pretty bright with supply and, um, and weather curtailments coming from China on their, in their domestic coal production. So, um, this bond, it yields 11.3% uh, over the next 11 years to the first call. Uh, it's a typically longer dated bond from an infrastructure asset. Although your security position is, uh, is not fantastic, you are what's called structurally subordinated. So we're lending to the holding company of the group. Um, that's partly uh, one the reason for that uh, extraordinarily high yield. Uh, I think what's attracting our clients to it is that even if there was an issue and, and they would be in a relatively low recovery position, that's a very good equity kind of return in something that uh, is obligated to pay you a coupon. So, you know, your returns are not variable, they're locked in. And, and you know, if things go well, then 11.3 is an exceptionally strong return in this environment. Oh, certainly is. Um, double digit, that's uh, pretty exceptional in this environment. And we're told it's uh, going to be remaining that way for some time. Um, what else are you watching as we head toward the close of the session and we go closer to the start of the UK and the US sessions, just briefly? Yeah, look, I mean, your point about the currency was, was interesting. It's, you know, it's popped up uh, on some good Chinese data. Um, I, I think our view on the currency is that, as you mentioned, you know, our 10-year bond, for example, is yielding nearly 50 basis points more than the US 10-year bond. Really, we're just, uh, you know, if you've got global capital flows, we're, we're just a spread to everything else, and, and that spread is positively in our favour at the moment. So there's a huge weight of money coming into our bond market to pick up that extra 50 basis points compared to the US, and, you know, almost 
nearly 2% uh, compared to those other negative yielding bond markets. So I think that's pushing our currency higher and, and it'll be interesting to see how high it does go. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, interesting times. Jonathan Sheridan, pleasure to have you here for them. Great, thanks Nadine. Jonathan is joining us from Fig Securities and it's time